Oh, just as we go live, my dog starts to say hello. That's how it is. <laughs> Kia ora, everybody. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us again for round two of this conversation. <laughs> we had a little bit of a false start yesterday and um, with the internet connection, but I'm really excited about tonight. I'm really excited about what we're going to delve into and mm. and um, I sense that there is a, is a big community within our early childhood sector who are really hungry to understand um, what we're talking about tonight, the Indigenous uh, perspective on, on child well-being. And mm -hmm. Hanamoa, welcome. Kia ora. And thank you so much for, I know that you're a, you're a pretty busy lady doing some pretty amazing things. So to have your time is really precious. Mm. Thank you. You've lived, lived a little bit of life, and uh, I know that you started off as, from correct me if I'm wrong, as an, as an actress on our TV screens. I think people would have um, remember you, might, might have remembered you from then, and then you've gone on, and you've actually gone and studied medicine and child psychiatry and are involved in research and all sorts of amazing things. Um, to tell, just to give us a little bit of context of of your life just give us a little bit of a short form of of that journey for you and what has driven you to be doing the work that you're doing today oh nama hi nui ke a kota katoa um e te waiti e te waita a uh, inga hau e fa a uh, nei a mihi karere ki a kota katoa he uri tēnei no muri whenua uh, ai no te tai toke rau a hau ko he ne moto ku ingoa Oh, thank you, Rick, and um, I'm so I'm so glad that the internet uh, atua have have blessed us tonight, um, and really look forward to having a, a conversation with you all this evening. Um, sure, um, just to just to preface my comments, um, I'm not a, I'm not an expert clearly in in all indigenous cultures and and child well being. I do. I have spent a lot of time with uh, our Tamariki Mokopuna Māori, and have done some research uh, with our Farno. So I'll, I'll be speaking from that perspective. Um, I have had the privilege of uh, working uh, and getting to know some colleagues from different parts of the world, from other indigenous communities, and and if there are some things that come up that I can share um, from those parts of the world, I will do so. But my 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 area uh, that I'm that I'm most familiar with is within Te Ao Māori, and so um, so that's what I'll be that's the that's what I'll be bringing forward this evening. Um, yes, as you say, Rick, um, I didn't start out uh, in medicine or in health in in that traditional sense. Um, I was very passionate about, and still am actually, about the arts, creative pursuits, trained as a dancer, um, worked as a choreographer, taught, for those of you who remember Lim's Dance Company and Tamaki Makoto way back in the day, I used to teach the little kids um, dance and music appreciation class and I used to go to company class. Um, did did some theatrical productions and went overseas and was involved in some creative productions at the Edinburgh Festival and things like that and came back to New Zealand with my daughter and um, did a bit of work in children's TV. Uh, and then um, my mother, our mother, got very sick um, with, um, with breast cancer and so we had a lot to do with doctors and other health professionals. And, and I have to say there was a, a certain um, realisation on my part that uh, not all these health professionals really understood uh, a, a Māori family. And, and um, it was very interesting to me because my, my mother, like many of that generation, um, had been very explicit with us that, you know, being Māori was not something to put out in the public, that people were going to judge you, going to discriminate against you if they knew that you were Māori. And so um, she she carried a lot of her own pain and suffering around that. And when she would talk to us kids about this, she would often cry. I suppose that was the reality that she was trying to pass on to protect us from the um, from the racist world that she perceived that we, we were living in. And so when she was when she was very sick and and, um, 
and dying, I, I started to think about, well, and this might sound pretty arrogant, and, you know, young people are naturally a little bit arrogant maybe, um, that maybe I could do a, a better job than some of these um, some of these Pākehā doctors who were trying to look after my mother and not doing a great job from my perspective back in those days. So um, that got me thinking. Uh, I, and so, yeah, long story short, um, one, one of the other ways actually that, that our mother linked me in with medicine was that she was very clear that she wanted to donate her body to the medical school, which was not, as, as many of you will know, was not something that was um, really appropriate actually or really supported. And yet within our wider whānui, 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 that was, you know, that was her dying wish and that was what happened. And so my father and I were the ones who liaised with the medical school when we uh, gifted my mum's body to them and also received her back. And the person that we dealt with at the med school was a guy that some of you may know, um, Professor Sir Richard Fall, who ended up having quite, I had, had quite a lot to do with him over my career, ended up being one of my teachers at med school, uh, one of my PhD supervisors and my postdoc panel supervisors. So um, it's interesting uh, that, you know, we many of us in the in the Māori world, we live those statistics of, of um, you know, early, early death. Uh, we don't have such a long life expectancy as as our Pākehā counterparts. And and this is something I see reflected in the in the Tamariki Mukapuna that I work with actually and, and people may want to reflect on that this evening. I noticed that one of the key um, divides between the Pākehā children that I was seeing and the Māori children that I've, I was seeing in the community was that Māori children have a lot more exposure to death. And I think this does have a profound impact um, and, and not always a positive one, unfortunately, because a lot of our cultural practices for a lot of our tamariki mokapuna are not always available. And so um, the the grief and loss issues that uh, that stem from from that exposure to so much more morbidity and mortality um, is something that we might, that you guys might see in early childhood environments where children are communicating their grief through their behaviour and because they, like many of us, struggle to find words, frankly, for these things, not only our tamariki, and so um, yeah, that was one of the one of the things that um, has been a thread that I've experienced um, and that I've seen working with children. So so um, back back to the sort of chronological story. I I went to medical school. Um, I loved it. It was it was wonderful, and at the same time, it was very clear to me that it wasn't a Maori friendly environment. And um, I had to sort of do a full body scan when I left medical school and make sure I left left the things that um, didn't belong to me there um, in order to be the best sort of fully formed Maori doctor that I could be when I when I graduated. And another thing that was very clear to me was that I needed to be able to learn to speak our language. Um, I wanted to be able to fully engage with our whānau at all generations. And I, I could see very quickly from, uh, you know, clinical times during our training that that I was missing out on a lot by not being able to speak our language in terms of really building a, a strong bond with the whānau that um, were needing medical care. So maybe I'll stop there and um, we can we can take up that story more if you want more of that particular story. <laughs> no, that's good. I think, I mean, I mean the thing that, that kind of piqued my interest here was when you talked about grief and death and Māori whānau having, uh, to be honest, now in the, the way I see the world, a healthier process of tangi and maybe kind of being with death rather than something that is um, kind of, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting space, a space where the Western world of um, almost, <laughs> what do they do with corpses? We kind of like inject some formal, formaldehyde and put it in a casket and then you, you see them once and they dress it up and then it's, it's almost like we're trying to hide this enormous part of nature and death mm. and um, 
so I do look towards at to the Maori worldview and in, in the way that they do tangi, and I think that it's actually healthy in a sense. What do you, what do you think? Oh, I think tangi hunger are incredibly healthy, incredibly healthy, and so of course, through the through the COVID nineteen um, period of rahui or lockdown, as some people have called it. And, and just in the last few days, there was a lot of distress in the Māori community about um, the seeming disparity around, well, you can have 10 people in a tangi, but you can have 100 people in a restaurant, um, and, and the, the legislation using the word marae. So, that, you know, we're, we're very sensitive, quite rightly, to um, constraints being placed on these cultural practices, which are essential parts of, if you like, cultural health and safety, which date back... Um, and have have been sustained because they help people with grief processes. I mean, I'm, I'm also aware that the, the three day tangi um, came out of the Spanish flu, 1918, 1920, and, and we actually before that we had longer periods of tangi because it was harder, it took took longer for people to gather um, from various parts of the country to go and and participate in those rituals. So. So the three-day tangi is, is a relatively modern version of a, an older practice. Um, but I, I agree that, that tangi hunger are in, incredibly healthy opportunities in the main. Yeah. Um, and so, so my comments were around, um, you know, many of our whanau are, are at different points in this, on this spectrum of of access to to uh, Maori spaces and practices, and many many whānau that I see, um, there's a lot of tensions there. There's a sense of man, well, maybe they're not Maori enough. They're not entitled to engage in such things. Many people feel quite estranged from their Maori identity. This is part of colonisation rolling along. So um, finding ways to have real conversations with Fano about that because often whānau have the sense they have an intuition about it they feel uncomfortable about certain things and they haven't actually had a chance ever to talk openly about it with anyone and so sometimes you know us um, whether we're in early childhood environments whether we're in health services we may be the first people that these whānau can actually talk to about their own experiences of growing up, their fears about what's happening with their children if, if their children are uh, struggling with learning or their behaviour is a bit unusual in, in, in the preschool environment or in the early years of school. So we have a unique opportunity to think um, broadly and intergenerationally about what might some of these threads be that are coming through that, that are kind of being perpetuated and manifest in, in what's happening for those tamariki. Beautiful. I, um, there's, I want to start off with, with this idea that, which I've heard spoken of quite often, and it says what, what works for Māori works for everyone. Right. And so within that, it implicitly applies that, um, it suggests to me rather, that within the construct of te ao Māori, extrapolated through tikanga, um, and uh, that that te ao Māori points to kind of what I like to call eternal truths or truths within the way that us our species really operates. And if we truly listen to the indigenous knowledge of Māori, we will also be able to understand deeply on how you know on some kind of like uh, base level mm. how how we can live together. And so. Um, I wonder if you can comment on that for me, because there is such a gold within Te Ao Māori, and my, my deepest desire would be for us to kind of point some language so we can understand why we make those statements. Yeah. Look, I, I think um, uh, just to take a step back, we, we know that there's so many similarities f uh, from iwi taki taki from, from Indigenous peoples around the world you know, our cosmological stories, um, our basic values are very similar. And I suppose the opportunity here in Aotearoa is that um, because manaki is at the heart of te ao Māori, manaki being 
hosting, caring for others, um, and, and also recognising that we need to care for ourselves in order to care for others, um, noticing things about what's going on for other people. Monarchy is also about being able to pause, notice, listen carefully, tune in. And, and so I think there is a unique opportunity here in Aotearoa for... Um, for the yeah, for the embracing of of Maori ways of thinking, Maori practices, Maori value systems, to be implemented really broadly for the betterment of of our country, you know, for the betterment of our nation building and a sense of national identity. What one of the one of the dearest wishes that I hold is that. Um, to become a bilingual society. So I think if we could take one simple strategy, well, it sounds simple, of course, implementation is another thing, but to, to prioritize the, the bilingualization of our country um, and, and have a real clear sort of targeted approach to that, I think that in itself would help legitimize what you're talking about it would also teach everybody the history, the real history of Aotearoa, and give us a true um, path for for healing. Because let's face it, yes, as Māori, we have our own pain and suffering and grief intergenerationally, but everybody else does too. Um, Pākehā people uh, intergenerationally are wearing stuff that is very difficult to talk about. So I'm really interested in... Um, strategies, mechanisms, um, you know, like-minded people getting together like this um, and thinking about how we in our own spheres of influence can can develop ways of working that really allow those things to take place. What do you think is at the heart of or, or the barriers that's really um, preventing us from embracing our, our country as a true bicultural country or bicultural kind of, you know, ling bi bilingual, sorry, country as well? The, the barriers are uh, structural racism and the, the, the mechanics of colonisation, which, which is still very much apparent, um, sometimes thinly veiled. Um, you, uh, you unpick any system of contracting, of... Um, system of government, I mean, I think our, our government has done a superb job, don't get me wrong, a superb job of managing this COVID-19, um, uh, managing the limiting of the transmission of the virus. I think that's been great. And then there are like these occasional like blunders which highlight that, that um, these barriers that you talk about. So, um, you know, we haven't got rid of colonization. So colonization is still alive and well. Um, you look at one example that comes to mind, um, Māori mental health services, uh, Māori-led um, Māori early childhood centres, for example, attract a different level of scrutiny. Um, I know for a fact that uh, Māori mental health services um, are audited much more frequently than non-Māori. So um, there's there's a whole lot of resources that goes into maintaining that 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 kind of scrutiny, which takes away from resources that could be um, utilised for the actual purpose of the organisation. I could give you lots of little examples where um, funding uh, and where, where money goes and who controls money is actually a re it's a really good indicator of the power relationships in, in, a, in a society. And unfortunately, we still have the message, um, yes, we, we see your issues, Māori community, but please continue to let the dominant culture um, fix those in the ways that, w that we think are best for you. Um. I think in our in our sector, I have noticed that we we have a very open heart. Um, Tafariki is one of the first bicultural early child early childhood curriculum in the world. 
it's yep. um, we, we have a strong um desire i'd say it, there's a strong intention and desire to embrace yep. what you're talking about i do find that there is a lack of knowledge and a lack of relational connection within our sector with uh with our maori and that and it, that, that may just be my lived experience I'm, I'm not speaking for this sector but it's just what i've observed is there's there's a ton of teachers who are like yes we agree yes we want to but we have no idea what that even looks like or how to connect in to mm. when it becomes to be honest it just becomes like uh signs on the wall right, right. rather than actually embracing the lived um the living knowledge of te ao maori within the culture of the center right so the, the one of the solutions to that one of the key solutions to that is to keep asking for maori leadership so you need maori leaders you need some people to champion in your area in your aspect of ministry funding to give you guidance um, and and to keep you safe um, and to help everyone build their capacity. Um, certainly in the health sector, we have the Health Practitioners Competence Assurance Act. Not, not that necessarily we need to rely on or should rely on laws to, to um, give us some sort of minimum standard, but it is helpful that it exists. And this law requires all the governing bodies of health practitioners to ensure that there is cultural competency that everyone can work with Māori. So I'm not sure to what extent that exists in the education sector. I, I know many uh, leaders in Māori education, uh, this is in fact, in, in many ways, um, you guys are actually light years ahead of what's happening in health. So I know there's a lot of Māori leadership within early childhood. Um, for example, I was lucky enough to do the Atafainga Te Pai Harakeke training way back in 2007, and that came out of um, early childhood education at the Ministry of Education and, and frankly, was a, a, just the most brilliant program. Um, don't know why the government of the day scrapped it, but that, you know, that, that sort of thing, those people still exist, um, they're still around. So if, if you're feeling like um, there's a lot of positive intention, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of desire to do the right thing and do it in the right way, then um, reach out to Māori leaders within your, within your sector and within your communities because they'll, they'll be there without doubt. Do you think that the structural racism or institutionalization, I suppose that's that's kind of you you found as a um, as a doctor or doing your medical studies uh, that many Maori find in education still? Um, if if we could do it differently, mm. what would that look like? Do you think? I know that's a really broad question, but yeah. Mm. I think that there's a number of models, and I suspect that, um, you know, I, I'm a great believer in local solutions for local areas at the same time as having a mindfulness about the national feel. So um, balancing those two aspects, I think some general, general principles that would make things better would be to have, um, you know, Māori leadership and education across the board and, and to have a, a system within the ministry and within the, all the structures that flow from the Ministry of Education that is accountable to Māori. So I, I have a lot to do with um, one of our kura kaupapa Māori in Auckland, uh, the kura kaupapa Māori o Hawani Waititi, which is arguably, you know, one of the most famous, it's one of the oldest kura kaupapa and of course, you know they have uh, Te Aho Matua, um, and and you know this is this is the bedrock of that whole way of working, um, and and it's not without its challenges within that system. How you might create um, a third way, if you like, that's that's somewhere in between Kura Kaupapa and current mainstream to ensure that you've got real quality teaching, teachers feel supported 
with the right resources um, at every level and that far no communities feel involved. So, for example, you know, if you're in, I see there's some people from Kirikiri, Namahi Nui Ki Akuto. Um, you've got you've got some heavy hitters up there. You've got Rahira Shortland lives up there. You've got uh, the Waiharoi Shortland lives up in your neck of the woods. Um, you know, the, in in the in the school environment, as as children go through their what we might think of as a mainstream school experience, that they will get the real history of that area. They will get local examples. Um, they will be, for example, supported to to learn in the outdoors. Um, I, I noticed recently that Scotland in the COVID environment, post-COVID, are looking at how they can expand outdoor uh, learning and curriculum for, for children as a, as a longer-term strategy because social distancing is going to be with us for a while. So, so that's a long-winded answer to your question. I, I think there are a number of components it has to be a successful approach, needs to be mindful of a national, um, consistent approach and to hold real um, the valuing of our, our precious local learning opportunities, stories, pipiha, um, and that this is, is very much woven through the the whole journey of learning from from when children are very small right the way through mm -hmm. the um the, your your phd i think focus which i'm quite interested in focused mm -hmm. on a framework to if i understand it to kind of for for maori a lens of maori assessment for tra for trauma really traumatic brain yeah. in this in, um, and i really enjoyed kind of the framework which you came up with, which is so deeply holistic, and I think it speaks so deeply to uh, mm. to the mm. goal that is within Te Ao Māori. So mm. I wonder if we can just kind of zoom into that for a second. Sure. Um, I think I, I wrote down, uh, you talked about the starting the process of wairua healing is the first thing that needs to happen for whānau, or that was one of the yeah. questions. Yeah, yeah. So shall I just give a wee bit of context for the people yeah, watching and listening? Maybe. So so I, um, I'd um i worked in the Starship and I'd seen some of our tamariki with brain injury and I was struck by the fact that there was sort of cultural silence around this. And I, you know, one of the things our mother had passed on to us as this, um, you know, woman, Māori woman growing up in that era was he tapu te upoko, the head is sacred. And it made me think, you know, why don't we use this? Why don't we use this Māori idea, this belief system in the treatment of, of uh, mental illness and the treatment of uh, tamariki with brain injury? So anyway, long story short, did a PhD, thought, well, I better crack on and find out more about this. So I did a marae-based um, methodology and had a couple of wānanga and nine marae around the country. And, and one of the distillations was what I call the sort of s the seven po. Um, and, and Rick's just alluded to the first one. And, 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 and then these um, helped me to construct the sort of theory of, of brain injury. But interestingly, I think, and many people, as I've been sharing this around the country, um, and since I've done my postdoc, have said, well, we want to use that for psychological trauma, or we want to use that for um, cardiovascular rehab when somebody's had a heart attack, or we want to use that in an inpatient unit. So actually, there's a there's a wider application of these ideas. And, and in fact, people from the Ministry of Education have been talking to me about this too. So, um, so right, the, the seven key principles, which I think, can be used uh, across a range of situations. Number one is wairua is the fundamental issue and has to be attended to as a priority. And I have to say, when I first, you know, I was going around these marae wānanga and, and some were in the city and some were nā hauewha and some were iwi marae, so different kinds of marae, rural, remote. This wairua thing just kept coming up everywhere. And you know, it was interesting to me because I thought, well, aren't some of aren't some of us in the Maori community going to go look stuff all of that tikanga? Let's just get the MRI scan happening. Let's get the bloomin', you know, every bell, every machine that has a bell on it. 
that that Western science can bring, and that's that's all we care about in in relation to brain injury. And that wasn't what people said at all. So so really interesting. Why do it is number one. Uh, second thing, whānau are the functional unit of healing. So what that means is, it's pointless just dealing with one individual in the whānau. It's pointless saying, what, well, right, this is all about the tamariki, this is all about the kid, we've got to fix up the kid and, and everything will be all right. That is not going to work. And I, I know I'm kind of preaching to the converted here because I can imagine you're all sitting there going, well, of course, you know. But think about it. How many services are organized on the premise that one-to-one -one mm -hmm. therapy one-to-one -one interactions with teachers, with specialist teachers, is actually going to really make the massive difference. When, in fact, we know our practice-based evidence tells us it's it may be necessary, but it's not sufficient. The third principle is that our whānau experience the, the clinical world, or let's say the educational world, as an alien culture. This is a bitter pill for us to swallow, to swallow, guys, but really it's... It's true, right? Our farmo do not often feel comfortable coming into schools, coming into kindies, coming into kohangas, coming into healthcare services because it pushes a lot of their buttons. They have already, many of them, been treated badly in those environments, have been judged. They maybe had bad experiences when they were young. So they're coming with a whole lot of luggage around what it means to interface with us, we are the authority figures. So I think that's another really important theme that came through that kind of upset me deeply on one level because I thought, oh, you know, we've moved on, we're so good now. But actually, no, it, it keeps us humble. Um, the fourth po is about Mātauranga Māori. Mātauranga Māori has a wealth of resources, whether it be to... Um, further explore issues around a brain injury, whether it be to further explore issues around the way that a child is learning and their unique strengths and their unique challenges, their behavior, um, their emotional reactions to certain things. Mātauranga Māori has this massive wellspring of material that we need to tap into. And one of the challenges certainly um, for us in health, and, and maybe you guys face the same, is often identifying who within that whānau whānui is the person who we can find an honouring way to bring them in because they hold a lot of that mātauranga. Or how do we actually bring mātauranga in in a way that isn't, um, you know, kind of, Takahite mana isn't stepping on the mana of that fano because the matauranga is within that whakapapa. So that's one of the that's one of the trick tricky parts of that, I think. And then number five, um, Maori Maori identity is about connection. So um, you know, I, I did a very brief little um, orientation to my my pipiha at the beginning. I'm from Moody Finua. Um, and, uh, you know, pepeha is something I can talk about till the cows come home. I use it a lot. I think it's a therapeutic tool. I think of it as ancient tech. You know, it's something that our ancestors arrived at very deliberately. It's like the sort of Māori da Vinci code. And when you can get whānau to really get involved with their pepeha, it's transformational. In the youth court, for example, the judges focus in the rangatahi court, when we have court omurai, the judges are focusing on the young person learning their pepeha and being able to stand and um, deliver their pepeha in a confident way without use of, you know, piece of paper and stuff like that. So the whole issue of connection and using, using um, identity, positive Māori identity as a way to unlock um New opportunities, potential when when things might feel difficult in a learning environment or a health environment. Um, and second to last, it's, it's kind of related. It's about places having a healing role. So um, you can you can and, and you guys will all know this. You know, you go on school trips, you go on you go on trips, you go around, and there'll be kids from Ngāti Whātua, let's say, if you're in Tāmaki, and they go to certain places that are very meaningful for them. 
you you go to the ngahiri if you're teaching in in Titai Tokiro and and the kids from there the local kids this is a way to instill that groundedness that they are actually part of that place this is a healing for them so i think that there's lots of opportunities that we can use places uh, much more readily in our learning and in our well-being approaches and then finally um, another, I think, critical issue, which is that other trauma is there. Uh, you know, we can talk about intergenerational trauma. Um, when we certainly when we talk about traumatic brain injury, when we talk about um, behavioural difficulties, emotional difficulties, sleep problems, eating problems, it kicks off other conversations about other things that are worrying people. And you guys will have heard family members say, oh, actually, you know, his papa was a bit like that when he was young. And, you know, um, and then they they might have another story about why that was. You know, maybe, maybe the grandfather was a very anxious child or maybe they had to move a lot for certain reasons. And so there were certain things that happened within whānau from, from previous generations that are being played out. And to be able to put that on the table with whānau in a way that feels um, feels comfortable, um, that that's part of the artistry of it, I suppose, is how to implement these sorts of ideas in the real world. So th those are the those are the po that um, that Rex talking about from my PhD, and and what I what I um, put forward was a theory that you know when a when a child, Maori child has an injury to the organ of the brain that their wairua is injured and that that's a cultural injury and so we have to use cultural interventions to heal that that aspect of the injury and I'm certainly not saying that we don't have to have every machine that goes beep and the MRI machine and and all of those other things but we have to address the cultural injury with cultural interventions and and I wonder about how uh, how that might feel for you guys in early childhood when you identify something that is um, a bit of a challenge and there seems to be some sort of disruption to wairua or that could be a way of thinking about it, how you can talk about that and how you can offer alternatives which are maybe more creative or tap into what I was saying about before that Matauranga Māori has a lot of resources to to support that that whānau through that time beautiful i am um, i'm gonna we're gonna go back because these seven flows are amazing and uh it seems that it's such a holistic way of looking at healing and i can understand why people in in the cycles psych in psychology and people dealing with emotional trauma can really find um so much hope when they when they kind of link into what you're saying so i, I want us to just because I know that there are people who are at varying degrees of understanding te ao Māori. So if you don't yeah. mind, just starting with, with wairua. Yeah. What does wairua mean? And um, why is that your number one, uh, when you talk about an injury to the wairua, I'm really um, curious to know what that means for you. Okay, cool. So um, Wairua is sometimes translated very simply and quite literally as spirituality or something to do with the soul. Um, mm. I, I think that's quite a limited translation, um, but I can see the utility of it in common parlance. What I learned through the research that I've done around this is that a, a broader translation, um, I think a more expansive and useful translation, is that wairua is the unique connection between Māori people and all aspects of the universe. That's quite a big deal, right? Mm. So imagine that your, your sense, and you may not have a conscious sense of this, this is, this is operating at the subconscious level of a being, right? That, that as, as Māori, the word, the word wairua is used to encapsulate this unique connection that you have as, as a Māori person with the whole universe. So any distortion, disruption, disharmony to that 
the flourishing of that connection, the fullness of that connection is going to impact on your health and your and your sense of yourself and your ability to concentrate and your ability to feel things in um, in the most adaptive way. So so um, this cultural injury that um, that my my work is focused on in, in terms of traumatic brain injury, but I think we're looking at kind of trying to extrapolate that a little bit more widely tonight is that when when there is a shock and you know if there's any kind of brutal shock to the to the mind body way to a system it's a it's a it's a blow to the head right we've talked about this is the most sacred part of the body so um a shift in consciousness many children who have traumatic brain injuries don't actually completely lose consciousness, but they have some fluctuation in their consciousness. It can be quite subtle. That shock, that that um, force, uh, that energy that, that ripples through the brain is, is causing a, a physical wairua disruption. And you see... Um, Aspects of evidence of that in, if you like, the traditional Western sense, people um, are a bit out of sorts. They might be grumpy. They might not sleep so well. They might vomit. They might just feel nauseated. Um, really young children might seem to be relatively okay. You know, there's this there's this mythology around kids, actually, that they always, oh, they're, you know, so resilient has bounced back, it's like nothing happened, maybe they've got a bit of a bruise, but there's nothing much to see. But there might be a bit of irritability, there might be, as I say, those changes to their sort of general um, activities of daily living. And then what can happen, and this is not just me saying this, this is international experts and people writing research papers from all around the world, is that these these what are called mild traumatic brain injuries in kids under the age of five, when we follow those kids up, what we see is much higher rates of things like ADHD, conduct disorder, substance abuse in teenage years, and in, in early adulthood, also higher rates of depression, anxiety, and problems with the law, for example. So, so that's one of the reasons that I got really... Um, concerned about the whole area of brain injury was that these seemingly innocuous accidents um, and of course some of this stuff is is uh, is caused by violence um, some of these incidents have long-term sequelae and so I'm always keen to talk to educators because I think we, we need to share. We need to be working much more closely together. And I want to build relationships with you guys, my colleagues in education, because you may well have a tamariki who you're looking after and you're working with and you're teaching who aren't quite getting it. And maybe people are worried about anxiety or ADHD or other things. And in actual fact, there could be a brain injury underneath all of that. So again, um, long-winded way of saying Wairua is about connectivity. So things that build connectivity are going to strengthen the wairua. And that the 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 disruption, the injury, um, and, and I think we can think of psychological trauma in the same way. Yeah. Psychological trauma and traumas um, shock shock the 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 mind, body, wairua system. In, in, in other ways, right? We, we've all seen that. Um, and, and it can se seem, again, to be quite subtle. We, we look at children and we go, oh, so resilient. You know, gosh, she's had such a hard life. And, you know, maybe mum and dad were on pee. And my old mum went to jail. Uh, she's been in Oranga Tamariki. But look, she's doing so well. And I'm, and I'm sure... These kids are doing well, and we need to focus on what is going well. Don't get me wrong. And we, when when Tamariki have experienced trauma, um, let's let's remember that 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 there is a way to an aspect to that that really does need to be attended to carefully, deliberately, with the right people around, um, because it might be a bit more complicated than it seems at first glance. 
yeah, how do you yeah. how do you restore and help that child or adult think back to their wider or right. heal the injury? Yeah. So so you 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 well my my research and and um, approaches that I've that I've developed and which are being used uh, certainly in TBI rehab and in, in other settings say that if you use those principles and I've also created a cultural assessment t a tool which means that you it's bilingual and you can assess the cultural needs of that whānau because remember we said it's it's never the individual tamariki you've got to work with the whole whānau and that includes when members of that whānau may be perpetrators in, in regards to the psychological or the physical trauma because when we leave people out um, it, it, there is there are some unresolved issues there so so that is another big challenge of course is the timing of involving different people uh, who were involved in perhaps the the primary cause of these problems um, but, but so so there is an approach there are some um, resources that can be used uh, and principles that can be used that involve let's look at the whānau, let's look at mātauranga Māori within that whānau, let's look at the connections of the places that are important for that whānau, that, that, those tamariki, and let's keep on the table that there may be other complicated trauma that we're going to have to sort out in the context of what seems to be the, the first issue you know, the index issue, as we sometimes say in medicine, which is, you know, the stupid jargon that we sometimes use. So I think coming back to um, how do you how do you move through and work with the whānau and walk beside a whānau who are going through this, you use these principles, uh, you use perhaps the cultural needs assessment tool, you involve kaumātua and kuia, if you can, for, who are related to these people, um, or if you can't find those in that particular point in time, maybe you have some available in your service who have some training around this. We do have some people like that in health services more and more, which is great. So that's just a, a very concise way of um, summarizing that there is lots that you can do. And um, yeah. Good, beautiful. So uh, it's, it's, it's not a situation where we – we can we 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 might feel wow this is not for me to be involved in this I I feel overwhelmed um, although at times it may feel overwhelming and and certainly that's where we we need to create groups of people who will support each other um, with this with this approach uh, and and feel purposeful and practical about what they're doing in a safe way. You I think you mentioned in one of one of your talks that. Um, uh, the the Fano needs to be seen as equal in skill for healing mm -hmm. as the medical practitioner. Yeah, uh, and I think that's very relatable for us in early childhood in terms of seeing the Fano as the first teacher, or the Fano as holding the container for healing and the container for growth and what growth and wider and everything for that yeah. child. And um, in that process welcoming their knowledge into our settings yeah I, this is this is another really important point thanks for bringing that up so i developed a a metaphor a tool called te waka oranga which essentially imagine if you're a bird flying overhead and you're looking down on a on a waka and um you can see people in the in the waka um people sitting side by side they each have a hoi and um so this metaphor is a, is a, a very Māori metaphor, very Polynesian metaphor. Um, you know, the waka is a sort of ubiquitous thing from our culture. And, and, and one of the things that I wanted to um, employ here is the idea that, as you've said, Rick, that whānau have crucial knowledge. We have to break down this idea that the doctors know everything that's need that you need to know. That's the most important knowledge is clinical, or that the teachers know all the things that need that are that are somehow privileged. Actually, we've we've created this problem within our uh, the philosophies of how we deliver learning, how we deliver healthcare. Um, this is wrong. 
So Farno come in to our settings and, and go, okay, teacher, teach my kid. Or okay, doctor, provide health things for my kid so they're now going to be healthy. And, and so what, what my tool is inviting people to do is to remember, to remind us, the professionals, actually be humble. These people are the experts in their own lives, not us. We know some stuff. They know some stuff. We've got to find ways to get all that material as, as equals involved in the waka. Otherwise, the waka ain't going to go where we want it to go, where the whānau wants it to go. Because that's the other thing, right? We can end up navigating a whānau in an educational pathway, in a, in a health pathway, which is not where they want to be going. And we have not listened to them. We've not listened to their navigational directions. The other, the other thing about this tool, which I, which seems to work well for people, is that the hoi involved have two sides, and and both the clinical team for us, the, the educational team for you guys, and the whānau have have hoi have paddles, right? So one side is about skills, and one thing is about emotions. So, of course, for Farno, they come into contact with us expecting to talk about their feelings, more or less. They do not come into our settings expecting that we're going to say, gee, so, you know, um, you've, got, you've got some skills there. I'm noticing these skills, these skills. They're not expecting us to reflect that back to them, right? Their, their usual experiences for people like us to say, well, you need to learn how to do this you need to do this better. Uh, you're not doing this, right? So this is a, a kind of a paradoxical way of turning the tables a bit. Equally for the professionals, my model expects the professionals to talk about feelings. Ooh, so that's a bit of a scary area, right? That's out of our comfort zone. But actually really, really important for our whānau to hear that we are emotionally involved. You know, there used to be this idea, and particularly in psychiatry, that we were we were opaque. You know, like we would never share, we would never show uh, any kind of facial expression. We would never talk about who we were in our real private lives. Actually, that's ancient kind of psychodynamic psychiatry. Nobody really practices that anymore. But somehow it's lived on. So, so in in psychiatry and in other uh, branches of medicine. We need to learn to say, you know what, um, I really, I really care about this because I, I'm, I'm, I'm worried, or I, I feel some fear about the potential, you know, where this is going. We need to find emotional words that we can use, and and it's not easy. I, I appreciate that, and I've worked with the, our rehab services around discovering some words that, that don't feel too scary for professionals to use. Equally, we're much more familiar with the skills part, right? We can talk about the skills that we we hope that we have or we think we might have uh, more readily. So so those are some other aspects um, of that of that model that, that Rick has raised and and I, I I can send you some papers that you can circulate, Rick, if you want, if people yeah. are interested to read more. For sure. Um, one one thing, and I'm just looking at time, and I'm just enjoying this conversation. So, hopefully, you've got a few more minutes. Sure. Um, uh, the the pipiha, which is the the one that you said you can talk for hours, but we've got minutes. <laughs> but, okay. tell, tell me, you 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 said so eloquently that it's like the Da Vinci Code, it's ancient tech of Maori. How can you help us understand the gravity and the power of pipiha, and why you say that? Okay. It's like many deep forms of ancient wisdom. It has many, many layers. And in, in, in Tao Māori, you know, we talk about um, the upper and the lower jaw. And they represent the, the worldly wisdom and the esoteric wisdom. So I'm not a tohunga. I'm not, uh, an, uh, I'm not like Po Timara or, or um, Timoti Karetu. But I, I can talk more about the kind of worldly aspects and a little bit about the esoteric wisdom, but I don't want to give any of you the impression that I am I'm at that level of, of, 
of tikanga knowledge, okay? So I just want, want to be clear about that. Pepeha in one, in one set is so brilliant because it's accessible and it's tangible. It's, it's essentially your address, your spiritual, your physical, your emotional address. It is a way of locating yourself in time and space so that other people can work on how they are connected to you. That's the function of it. So back in the day, our old people had a lot of different pepeha. They had a lot of different ways that they could connect. So if they were going to a hui or a wānanga in Kahunganu, they would emphasize the aspects of their pepeha that connected them to Kahunganu. If they were going to Waikato, they would emphasize, and sometimes they had different names even. So they would be known by a specific name when they went there. Uh, uh, my son is one example. When he goes to Ngāti Pro, he's called Api, Apirana. And there's a whole other story around that. But just to give you an example, that this is not just ancient stuff. This is happening in the contemporary world. So, so this one way to think about pepeha is that it's super accessible. So the simplicity of it is genius, right? Essentially, it's about st you in your mind. You can go and stand on the beach that you loved when you were growing up. And you can go, wow, this beach really influenced me. I had many summer holidays here. It's part of me. So for, for us as Māori, we can go to the mountain, the mountain of our ancestors, and we might know the story of those ancestors. So for me, one of the places that I like to talk about in my pipiha is this little island called Murimotu, which is way up in the far north. And when I think of, I can, right, I can go there in my mind. You know, this is, this is before the iPhone. This is before the device. That's what I mean by ancient tech. They understood that you have, you know, you have the app to go to the place in your mind. You don't have to be there physically. So I can go to Murimotu and I can remember the story of Tumatahina who saved our people by being super smart one of the things he did is he said, okay, they want to kill us. We're going to hang here. We're going to make a rope. We're going to get across from the island to the beach. And I've got really big feet. So I'm going to go first, and then you're going to step in my footsteps in the sand so the people who want to kill us will think there's only one person. So when I, when I, do, when I say that place, just the name of that place in my pipiha, I have that whole backstory, right? I have that whole little... Um, YouTube video going in my head. Equally, I say my my river, Awapaka. This is actually for my people. They they dug this river. Back in the day, they knew they had to create a conduit from the ocean right into the center of town, in Takao. Any of you who know Takao know that it's um quite a small town. So, so my point being, Pepeha has this beautiful entryway that's seemingly really simple you just say the words of the places this is my mountain this is my river this is my waka this is my meeting place these are my tribes and we have we have a saying in Tao Māori iti te kupu nui te kōrero. just a few words but in those few words you are saying volumes it's like you're sharing a library it's like an encyclopedia. That's what I mean about the Da Vinci Code. It unlocks a whole lot of stuff. So that's just that's just a real basic way of, of introducing it. And, and I invite you all, no matter where you're from, to think about your pepeha. My, my particular view is that pepeha is a, is a technology that is on offer to all Um people who live in Aotearoa or people who work in Aotearoa, no matter where you come from. And, um, you know, if, you, if you're going to work with Māori whānau and you can say, hey, you know, ko, ko tawhiti rahi te maunga, ko awa paka te awa, ko, ko ngāpuhi te iwi, what, whatever you say in a tiny little pepeha like that, Māori whānau will be like, okay, 
this person has taken some time to think about what's important to me and my culture. That shows enormous respect. And in my experience, when you do that, people open up to you differently. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, before we go on, uh, there's a third yeah, guest in the room. I'm going to introduce him quickly. It's, uh, it's, your, it's your snoring companion. Uh, we do need to yes. see it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, can you hear the snoring quite loudly? Oh, yeah. This is, oh, this is wanna... my dog. Can you oh, see yeah. him? <laughs> yes. Hello. His, his name is Bear. Hello, Bear. Hey, <laughs> he, he, he's found it very um, relaxing to listen to this quarter or by the sounds of it. I, think so. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you are, you've written a book. I don't know if it's your first book. Is this your first book that you've written? So, yeah, I, um, I've i written book chapters before, but I have written a book um, for Penguin Random House UK. It is um, just now available for pre-order. I'll tell you a little bit about it. It's, um, it's called Aroha. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it's contemporary. It's, it's um, ancient Maori wisdom for a more contented life in this crazy modern world that we live in. And it takes the form of 52 whakatauki, whakatauaki, Maori proverbs, one for every week of the year. And so I present those. There's four, there's four different chapters or groupings of the of the pepeha, and then I've written some reflections on each one, how it's affected me in my life, um, and I, I pose some some challenges to the reader. Um, I actually ask the reader to write their own fakatoki at the end of the book. I've written a fakatoki in the book, fakatoki for the planet. Because um, I'm also really intrigued about how we return to our role as kaitiaki. This is good for our mental health. It's good for our learning. Uh, it's good for the development of our tamariki mokapuna. The more deeply we can be involved with uh, healing papatunuku is actually about healing ourselves. So, yeah, that's the book. Um, I can, I'll can. i send you a link, uh, Rick, if you want to share it yeah, with the group. For sure. When, when is that being released? Uh, that will be released at the end of September. Perhaps when it's released, we can do another korero, uh, a little bit more oh, focused sure. around, around the book, because that I can imagine that a lot of people would want to understand and know, know more about yeah. that. I've got a, just a oh. couple of questions. Have you got five minutes for? Sure, sure. Fire two, away. Two, two, two to five. <laughs> I'll be quick. Okay. Um, let's just see. I, it's a few... I know one was, um, how do you approach uh, whānau who don't um, connect as Māori whānau with an approach yeah. like that? How do we connect with, connect this yeah, mm. world view? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It's something um, I get asked and, I, I, and I've pondered a lot and discussed a lot. So there's a couple of thoughts on that. One is that, We've taught Māori whānau to leave their mouldiness at the door and pick it up on the way out in many, in many cases, in hospitals, in healthcare, in school. So we have to be careful about how whānau present themselves to us as this sort of neutral family when, in fact, their Māori stuff might be really, really important to them, but it, it takes a while for them to trust us enough to share it with us. So that's one scenario. There, there may be some far note who like go look this just doesn't speak to me right now I, I can't relate to this uh, and that's fine the, the other the other possibility which is about the majority of Maori um, and and I base that statement on some surveys that I've that I've looked at which show that you know uh, if you look at the statistics New Zealand did a survey a few years ago and there's another older one from the Ministry of Heritage and Culture that showed that more than 50% of Māori were um, doing basic sort of cultural activities, going to the marae relatively regularly and engaging in other sort of culturally marked activities. So that suggests to me that we have some myths also, which are that a lot of Māori don't really relate to being Māori. I think that that is part of the colonization propaganda 
actually uh what, what what my mentors also say to me is like it's normal for maori to get maori stuff and to at some stage feel open to that as maybe even a catalyst for their reconnection with our culture because that may be at the very heart of the trauma right when our maori whanau go oh no no that's not me or i'm a bit of a plastic maori i don't know my whakapapa you know, that's all good. That's all good. We strike this all the time, right? And I and I say to Fano, no worries, no worries. And let's just keep that door open because that might be your experience, but we don't know what's going to happen for little Tama here or little Roimata, you know, and maybe there's some stuff that we need to work through in this context that fits with the principles we talked about earlier, yeah? Other trauma. So maybe when Fano is saying, nah, 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 it's actually a sign of trauma. Beautiful. I think it's so valuable. I think we'll leave it there. This has been such, I've got so so many more uh, little little things and thoughts, but um, it's always nice leaving wanting more. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you, Rick. Nā mihi nui ki a koe te tūmwaki o tēnei, tēnei puna. Um, yeah, that's really, what a, what a cool, what a cool concept. Thank you so much. It's been it's been wonderful. I know that our sector is is definitely richer for for your input and and um, and your openness to wanting to cross kind of boundaries. You know, I suppose between health and education. I think that's really great. It's critical, right? We need to be more joined up for the for the improvement, for the betterment, for the advancement of all of our tamariki and their whānau. So yeah. I wish you all well. Um, kia kaha koto. It was lovely to spend time with you, and I hope we do it again sometime. Sure. Namahinui, kakite. Namahinui, kakite.